Memorial Day weekend. It's a great time for many of us. You get to see some family that maybe that you hadn't seen before. My my uh, my mom's going to be traveling up this afternoon. Just uh, first time that she's been able to to come down here, just because of all that was going on with my dad for so long. So you know, going to be a special time, and maybe it's a special time for you. Maybe you've got plans for uh, get together with family, have a cookout, or go play some golf, or I, I don't know, go swim in the river. I don't, I don't know what you're going to do for, you may not want to do anything as hot as it's going to be the next couple of days, but Memorial Day is usually a special time that people take advantage of. That's why, you know, there's obviously some folks who are not here who, um, who, who are normally here. Memorial Day is, um, it, it is a, a great time for a lot of different reasons, and sometimes I think that the real reason behind Memorial Day is kind of gets lost upon us. Memorial Day is different than any other day that we have, though we put up a, we put up a flag, and uh, we're going to do that again in, in just about a month, and then we'll do it again, uh, you know, Veterans Day, we'll, we'll pull that out again in, in, in November and remember our veterans, but there's nothing quite like Memorial Day. Memorial Day actually started, if you didn't know, called, being called Decoration Day. That's all it was called. It was just a a day where they, uh, where the people honored veterans who had passed away, specifically during the Civil War. So it has been being celebrated for quite a long time. Memorial Day was officially proclaimed on May the fifth of 1868 by General John Logue, and he uh, he was the national commander of the of the Grand Army of the Republic. And all he did was he, he just wanted to observe it May the 30th 19, of 1868 and they took flowers and placed them on the graves of all the, the Union and Confederate soldiers at Arlington National Cemetery. That is really where it all began. The, the first state to officially recognize the holiday wasn't for a few years later. It was New York in 1873, so it had been being practiced for about five years. But really, it took a long time for it to spread even beyond that. Some 17 years later, 1890, it was being recognized by all the northern states. But you know how how we are in the south. We've got to do our own thing, our own way. That's why we're called the rebels. And, uh, And we didn't recognize that day. We refused to, actually, until after World War I, the Great War, after World War I, Memorial Day was meant to honor all veterans who had died in all wars, and it was at that time that the, that the South began to also recognize it. Just, not just Civil War veterans, but all wars. To my knowledge, all states now recognize Memorial Day and was passed by Congress as a national holiday back in 1971. We use it to honor those who have actually died in service, those veterans who have passed on before us to secure our freedom. Freedom is obviously something very important to us, something that we, that we celebrate, something that we staunchly defend. We may define it differently. We may have perverted the definition of freedom in a lot of different ways, but still freedom is something that we value greatly, and it's something that we can, uh, that we can still practice this day because of many who have gone before us who have given their lives uh, because in, 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 a, in ways that we do not have to, that we have not had to, and that's why we sit here breathing and living today. I want to talk to you about that freedom, about freedom that we yearn for. The message today is titled, The Freedom Our Hearts Yearn For, and I would ask that you would Turn to John chapter 8 in your Bibles, whether you pull it up on your phone, pull it out of the pew sitting in front of you, or maybe hopefully you brought your own Bible. Turn with me to John chapter 8, and I would invite you to take out this, uh, this growth guide that was included there in your bulletin, and a, few place, uh, a place for you to take down just a few notes that are there, something you can hold on to for later. Freedom is something that we value, but it's also also something that the heart yearns for. I want you to notice the quote from Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. there in your outline. It will also be on on the wall behind me. 
He said, oppressed people cannot remain oppressed forever. The yearning for freedom eventually manifests itself. A people can be held down for a long time. A people can be enslaved for a long time. We've seen that throughout the course of history with many, many different peoples. But it will not go on forever. People yearn in their hearts for freedom. And people eventually will fight for that freedom. Whether or not they ever earn that freedom before that death, I do not know. That's, that's give or take. depends on the sovereignty of God in many different cases. But eventually it will come out. Eventually people will pursue freedom. And even the Bible, even Paul in Galatians chapter 5, even he said, For you were called to freedom. It is something that we yearn for. It is something that we will pursue. And it's something that God offers to us. On one level that we get to celebrate here today and that we remember today, on one level the sovereignty of God has gifted us a freedom within America that allows us to do what we are doing right now without the threat of persecution or enslavement. We are called to freedom. And it's that freedom that I believe that Jesus taps into, that yearning for freedom that he taps, to, taps into in John chapter 8, and he really goes to the heart, to the crux of the matter of freedom. Freedom goes beyond what most people will celebrate today. Even those who, or tomorrow I guess uh, specifically, it's the first Monday, of, I mean it's the last Monday in the month of May, but, uh, but even those who are patriotic, even those who will post on Facebook, I've, you know, you've seen the post, if you have Facebook, you've You've seen the post, here's what, here's, in case you're wondering what, real, what Memorial Day is really all about, and you've got, uh, you've got one side where people are at the beach and having a good time, but then on the other side you have, you have coffins that are draped in American flags. And even, even people who are patriotic and they are recognizing Memorial Day for what Memorial Day was set aside for in the United States, even that falls short of what God offers to you and to me. There is something more that we yearn for and something more that God makes available. And it's that freedom that Jesus is talking about in John chapter 8, beginning in verse 31. That is where we will pick up here this morning. And I have found, I've I've, I've always appreciated the latter part, usually beginning in verse 39 and going to the end of the chapter. John chapter 8 has always been, just held a special place in my heart for many different reasons. But I have come to see John chapter 8 in a whole new light, and there is so much that is packed into this chapter. I would encourage you to go read it. And, and honestly, um, and I'm, this is going to bear up in what I will say in a few moments, I believe that you could read John chapter 8 every single day this week, and you would find something new breaking out uh, to you every single day that you would do that. And I would dare say that you could probably do that for the next month, but I would challenge you just for the next week. Read through John chapter 8 and see if God doesn't show you something new that just blows you away every single time. Here's what he says in in John chapter 8, beginning in verse 31. So Jesus was saying to those Jews who had believed in him, he had been preaching to them and talking to them. Verse 30 says, as he spoke these things, many came to believe in him, and so he He wants to disciple them. He wants to encourage them. He wants to draw them closer and teach them what true discipleship is all about. True discipleship isn't a mental ascent, a mental evaluation, a mental acceptance of what has previously been spoken. And that is what is borne out throughout John chapter 8. And it's a very dangerous position that I believe that many people find themselves in in American churches today, that they take what what the Bible has to say and they mentally accept it, they mentally affirm what the Bible says, but they never become true disciples. So he's going to teach them, here's what true discipleship is all about. He says, if you continue in my word, then you are truly disciples of mine. And you will know the truth, and the truth is will make you free. 
First thing that we find here is we find the pathway to freedom. The, you will know the truth, and the truth will make you free. This is, a, this is a, a, a statement of Jesus that is one of the more popular statements of Jesus around the world. It's only used so incorrectly. You'll find this in many places, inscribed even in buildings of famous universities and places of higher education, and maybe not even higher education, what we would call higher education, just places of education, then people will say, you'll know the truth, and the truth will make you free. And, and listen, I, I, you'd be hard-pressed to find someone in this room who cares more, believes more in education than I do. I, I love school, man. I've, I've, I spent 25 years of my life in school, and I would go back, I was telling somebody just the other day, I would go back and get another degree but I would rather stay married, and so I'm not pursuing that. I love education. I love going to school. I'd be a professional student if I could. It just doesn't happen. And so, so I, I hear this, and I, I think about people who, who absorb this and who, who quote this passage, you will know the truth, and the truth will make you free, and they use it in an academic setting, and it, that is really so limited. It's really limiting what he's talking about when it comes to truth because as important as academics is, he's not talking about academic achievement. Getting a better, more in-depth education in whatever field you want to think of that may or may not bring freedom to you. There is no promise or guarantee in that. There is a guarantee in what Jesus is truly talking about. He says there is a pathway that you go. He says that pathway is you continue in my word. You continue in my word and you will end up free. You continue in my word and the, 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 the first fruit of that is, is you become a true disciple of his. And when you become a true disciple of his, that is when you know the truth. And when you know that truth as a disciple of his, then you become truly free. And, I'm not, and I'm, what I'm talking about is I'm talking about the freedom that our hearts truly yearn for in the depths of our soul. If we want to be true followers of his, there are a few, few ways that we must respond to his word. These are there in your outline. First of all, true followers of Jesus learn his word. That's why the psalmist said, and notice I've quoted all of Psalm 119. That's another great chapter in our Bible that affirms the Word of God. Psalm 119 verse 27 says, Help me to understand your teachings. I just want to know what it means. I just want to know what it says, and I want to know what it means. I want, to, I want to learn His Word. About, a, about an hour ago, we were, we were getting ready to let out of a time that is a great time set aside for you to learn His Word. It's called, it's called Sunday School, and some people are turned off from it because it has the word school in it. Some people are turned off from it because it sounds like something that kids do. Listen, it's something for anyone who values learning God's Word. I would encourage you to be there. Be there next week, 945. We'll help you find a place to learn His Word. But it's not, it doesn't just stop there. It'd be nice if it just stopped there because just because you come to Sunday school doesn't mean that you've reached the apex when it comes to, um, to the communication from God. Because true followers of Jesus also labor over His Word. They labor. This is, this is hard work. You, you have to dig into it. Some people will say, well, I don't want to I really have a hard time reading the Bible. I don't, I don't read the Bible on my own because, I, because it's hard. I, I just don't understand it. It just doesn't make sense to me. And I get that. I, I, I've, I've, been, I've been around the Bible for so long that I forget that there are some people that they just, they just struggle with some of the, what some other people might call the easiest concepts. And so, listen, I want you to, I want you to, I want you to be encouraged. Everybody is going to start somewhere when it comes to this kind of thing. And if you are struggling, let me tell you something. It's okay, but don't quit because sometimes it is a labor. It's a, it's, it's a labor for me. It's a labor for some people who in, who in here, they've been studying for years and decades. 
They have been around this Word, and they have been studying the Word, and they have even been teaching the Word. But there are some things that they struggle with, and it takes hard work sometimes to dig in and to get out what they want out of the Scriptures. That's because it takes labor. True disciples will labor over that word. They don't just read over it, just passively read over it, and then they jump to their open windows or their, or their Sunday school material or whatever it might be. No, they are going to stick to that word. They're going to read it on their own. They're going to study it. That's why the psalmist said, How I love your teaching. It is my meditation all day long. Third path, part of the pathway to freedom is true followers of Jesus listen to his word. Look at what the psalmist says there. I pondered the direction of my life and I turned to follow your laws. How many times do we come up to decisions in our lives? Decision of where we're going to go, what we're going to do, what job we're going to take, how we're going to spend our money, how we're going to spend our time. We try to, we, we try to make all these decisions about our lives and we never seem to consult God. Or if we do, God, God, give me guidance in this thing. Give me guidance in this decision that I have to make. In Jesus' name, amen. And then you go off and you fret and you worry and you worry. How many times do we dig into the scriptures and we say, God, what is it that you have for me? What direction do you want me to go in? What job do you want me to take? How do you want me to spend this part of my life? What, what ministry do you want me to be a part of? How often do we approach the Bible with questions like that? But a true follower is going to ponder the direction of his life, turn to the law of God. And when he does, and when he gets God's answer from studying and from prayer, true freedom will come to him. And then finally, true followers of Jesus live his word. It's one thing to know what God wants. It's one thing for God to make his direction clear. It's a whole other thing to step out in faith and say, by an act of my will, I am going to do what I know God has led me to do. But that's why the psalmist also said, your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. It shows me the way in which I am to live and therefore I will live according to God's word. Now, according to Jesus, who just happens to know more than I know, and he happens to know more than anybody that I have met, according to Jesus, that is the pathway to true freedom. And people will mock that in the world, and there will be people even in the church who will doubt that. But that is what Jesus says is the pathway to true freedom. And of course, whenever Jesus is involved in something, whenever, whenever Jesus wants to lead in a certain direction, there's always someone who wants to come in and to break up the rhythm of that path. Someone who wants to take you and divert you in a different direction. And it might be someone, it might be Satan, it might be Satan using someone, but there's going to be someone who's going to try to divert you off of that path. And I simply call this the perversion of our freedom. Notice their answer to him when he, he says, and again, they're, they're doubting also. They, you know, he just, he's just saying, just listen to me. Just do what, I, do what I tell you to do, and you'll have freedom. And they decide that they're going to argue with Jesus. They answered him in verse 30, 33, We are Abraham's descendants and have never yet been enslaved to anyone. How is it that you say you will become free? A perversion of our freedom. Now, if you know anything about Israel's history, you know what a ridiculous statement has just been made. What, they said, we have never been enslaved to anyone. And what Jesus is about to do, he is about to open up their minds to what true freedom is all about and to what true enslavement is really all about. And I'll bet, my guess is, is if we would look at this at a new light, he would do the same thing for you and me today. You see, we look at this from our Western, our Western viewpoint, from our Western mindset, from the mindset of a guy and a girl who grew up in the United States. And we're thinking, these people are nuts. Because you think about the history of Israel. They were enslaved to Egypt. They were enslaved to the Assyrians. 
They were enslaved to the Babylonians. They were enslaved to the Medes and the Persians. They were enslaved to, the, uh, uh, to, the, to, to Rome. They were enslaved to Egypt again. They were enslaved to, uh, uh, to the Syrians. They were enslaved at the very time that they were speaking this word. They were enslaved to the Romans. In fact, in fact, my Bible, my study Bible that I have, that I have in my office, that I read a lot, I appreciate that study Bible, but it's very interesting what they said. In the notes in my study Bible, it says, an amazing disregard of their Roman overlords. How could they have, how could they have made the statement that they were free and had never been enslaved to anyone, and yet very seldom in the history of Israel, when you look at the course of, of the history, how seldom it was that they had really been free. But you know, we say all that from our own mindset, from our own Western understanding of freedom. You see, and here's in your notes, it says, we identify freedom from a political viewpoint. That we assume that if we don't answer to another country, that we are free. Now, from that viewpoint, what they have just said in verse 33 is utterly ridiculous. I mean, they, they have got to be so delusional to believe this. The only thing is, is they weren't Western. They weren't American. They didn't see things the way that we see them. You see, they, they viewed freedom from a totally different vantage point. The Jews viewed freedom from a lineage viewpoint. They were descendants of Abraham. Spiritually speaking, he says, or, or, or from, from a lineage standpoint, we have never been enslaved to anyone. If I can call myself a son of Abraham and I can prove to you that I'm a son of Abraham, then I am free. Cyril of, Cyril of, uh, of Jerusalem, he was a famous theologian back in the fourth century. And here's what, here's what he said that kind of gives us a, uh, some insight into that mindset. He said Joseph, meaning Joseph in the Old Testament, in back, all the way back in the story of, uh, in Genesis, Joseph was sold to be a bond slave, yet was free, all radiant in the nobility of his soul. A recognition that he was in slavery, and yet at the same time he was free because he was of the line of Abraham. That's how Jews thought. And so they're saying, Hey, we've never been slaves to anyone because we are of the line of Abraham. Now, Jesus is about to turn all the tables because he's going to tell him, you know what? You can be of the lineage of Abraham. And you know what he's going to tell you and me today? You can live and you can be uh, a, uh, a citizen of the United States and you will still be enslaved to something and still in need of freedom, a freedom that your heart yearns for, a freedom that you didn't even know existed that I can give to you. But we, will, we have a tendency to take, to take this, uh, this, uh, this freedom and we twist the meaning of it. And then when we twist the meaning of freedom, we find ourselves enslaved. Because notice, notice what he says, Truly, truly, I say to you in verse 34, everyone who commits sin is the slave of of sin. Wow. Wait, well, oh, no. I'm an American. This is Memorial Day. We're remembering those who provided for our freedom. And Jesus says, but you're not even free. You're not even free. Everyone who sins is a slave of sin. Paul, Paul backed that up in Romans chapter 6. Don't let sin rule your body. Don't you know that you are slaves of anyone you obey? You can be slaves of sin and die, or you can be obedient slaves of God and be acceptable to Him. You used to be slaves to sin. We're all slaves to someone. We're a slave to our sin, or we're a slave to God. Notice, even Socrates says, How can you call a man free when his pleasures rule over him? the perversion of our freedom. And then Jesus, oh man, Jesus, he's really about to, to turn the knife on them, but he's, he tells them that there are perks to our freedom. The slave does not remain in the house forever. 
the Son does remain forever. In other words, there are people who are, who are true followers of Jesus. They are true children of God. And they have all the rights and the benefits that come along with being a part of the family of God. And that is, a, that is one of the, the perks of being a child of God and, and knowing that you're all the inheritance that comes and all the blessing that comes with being one of God's children. And then he, but, but Jesus says, you know what, there are a lot of people who are pretenders. That's what we would call them today. They're pretenders. They're walking around in the house, and they think that they're free. They think that they're on the same level as a son, and yet they are not related at all. And I want you to notice that those slaves, those slaves who are in there, who are there in the house, they get all the perks too. They get all the good food. They get, they get the, the, the nice clothes. They get the, they get the nice air conditioning. You know, they, they get all the perks that go along with being a child. It's a, a child of the, of the dad of the house. And it's a, it's a great place to be. And there are a lot of people who have experienced a lot of perks of the kingdom. Just think about here in America. I want you to think about America, how, how, the, how the hospital system started. You know how the hospital system started? You know how the hospital system was really propelled? By believers. We've got one here in town, named after a saint. Whether or, not you, whether or not you believe in all that stuff, it was started by those who claim to be Christians. I want you to think about our university system. I want you to think about our educational system, the best in the world. The educational system began by believers. The Ivy League schools, just I, 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 to, to the best of my knowledge, all of them but one began for religious purposes. Now, they might be denying it today, but they, are, they, they began for religious purposes, and their education, their higher education, has spread on down all throughout America for all of these years. There are a great number of perks just from being in that family atmosphere, even if you're not a part of the family. But the dangerous part, the dangerous part of, of that position is, is that you get the thinking that you're a part of the family. And Jesus says, man, you get, you get those perks, man. You, get, you hang around believers long enough. You hang around my, my followers long enough. You hang around my children long enough. And you're, those blessings are going to spill over into your life. But at some point in time, they will end. Because a son will remain in the house forever. A slave will eventually get kicked out. There are perks to the freedom even if you're not truly free. Catch that. Jesus is he's, 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 digging, to, he's digging deep today. He's, he's hitting where, where they really live, and he's really attacking what they thought was freedom. And he says, oh no, you're not free. You are just experiencing the perks of freedom. But eventually you're going to find out what a slave you are. What is the difference? What is the difference between a slave and a son? How do you know if you're part of the family or if you're just living in the house? The last point that Jesus is going to make is the price for our freedom. So in verse 36, if the son makes you free, you will be free indeed. The price of our freedom. We like to say, especially at this time of year, and rightfully so, I, I say a, a, a huge thank you to our veterans, and if we could speak to those who had given their life for us, we would tell them the same thing. We say thank you. And at this time of year, especially on this particular weekend, we should make much of the saying that freedom is never free. There is a price for freedom. There's a price for the freedom that we live in in America. There is also a price for you to have the freedoms that your heart really longs for. The heart yearns for. And that price, I, I read through so many quotes about freedom this past week. And 
People talked about how it's, you know, it's got to be earned by each and every generation, and you can't just, uh, you can't just bestow it on the next generation. You've got to earn it, and, and so on and so forth. And I understand all that. I get that. In the context of America, that's true. The generations that we're in now and the generation that it is to come, you will have to, you will have to earn that freedom to hold on to it. There's no doubt, and there's more and more threats, and it seems to me like more and more of those threats are coming from the inside of our country than there are the outside of our country, but that's a whole other story that we'll get into later on. What I'm telling you is it is going to have to be earned, and it is going to have to be fought for in order to be kept. But what you need to understand is when it comes to the deepest need of your heart, the deepest need of your life, the freedom that your heart truly yearns for is nothing that you can earn. That's what makes it so difficult. Because it is, it, the, the price was already paid by someone else. He figured out, he realized, he knew from eternity past that you and I would never be capable of earning that freedom on our own. We would be utterly enslaved forever. So Jesus himself came to the earth and he secured our freedom for us. You can't, buy it, you, you can't buy it, I'll buy it. You can't pay that price, I'll pay that price. That's what Jesus said. That's why, that's why I see it in, in many pa passages. But Galatians chapter 5, it was for freedom that Christ set us free. Romans chapter 6, Paul also said, Our old self was crucified with him. He died. We are found in Him, we must die also. Our old self was crucified with Him in order that our body of sin might be done away with so that we would no longer be slaves to sin. How do we escape sin? How do we escape this bondage that we're in, that we're all born in? It's only when we are found to be in Christ. When He, recognizing that He is the one who paid for our freedom, and we secure ourselves in Him. We receive Him and we become a true follower of His. That's why he says, man, that's why he starts out by saying, you want to be a true follower of mine? Stay in my word. You stay in my word, you'll be a true disciple of mine, and you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. My question to you today is, is are you in bondage? Are you still in bondage to your sin? Let me, we're, we're all slaves to something who are you enslaved to? You enslaved to your sin? You enslaved to, your, to, your, to those people that you're trying to please all the time? Are you enslaved to the church? You enslaved to your own self? Who are you enslaved to? Jesus comes and says, I will, I will set you free. You can come and be a part of our family. You can come and not just live in the house. You can be a part of the family. And you will never, ever be cast out. If you're not a part of the family of God, we want to invite you to come and be a part of the family of God and experience a freedom that you've never had anywhere else. It's a freedom that America can't give you. It's a freedom that no country, no person, nobody else could give you. Only in Jesus Christ. And if you don't know Him today, we invite you to come and surrender to Him. Give your life to Him. I'll be standing down front during the invitation time. You can come and say, hey, I want to I be set free today. And we can go through the steps. We can talk about it. We can at least begin that conversation. You may want to come down to the altar. You may want to pray for, for someone that you know who is enslaved to their sin. You may want to come and pray for this nation that you live in. Who knows where we're headed? I know a lot of people are very concerned about our nation. Maybe today is a day for us to come and bow before God and say, God, we are enslaving ourselves. God, set us free. Bring a revival to our land. You do as God would lead during, during that invitation time. Right after I pray, we'll stand to our feet and you do as God leads. Lord, we, we thank you for the freedom that many paid their lives for. For us to be able to be here today in comfort, in security, in, in joy and in fellowship with one another. We just thank you for those who have made that possible. But Lord, we, above all, we thank you for what you have done for us. For giving us freedom, no matter what our political circumstances are, no matter what the, what the world is going through, we can have freedom nonetheless. We thank you that we found it in you. 
God, I pray for those who are still enslaved. They might be, they might be living in the house. They might be very actively living in the house. But they're not children of yours. And one day their tenure with you will come to an end. Save them, God. There are souls who are in the balance right now. Save them. Convict them. Help them to see their lost condition. And may they come to know you, receive you this day, this moment. May they surrender to you and experience true freedom. We thank you for making that possible. Now during our time of invitation, help us to respond in a way that brings honor to you, that lets you know, that demonstrates to you that we have heard you. In Jesus' name, amen.